Hi friends, welcome to the War Heroes channel. Today, we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. 1st January 1943, the first morning of the new year when I awoke the fire was already flickering in the stove. I thrust my legs into my boots, slipped on my uniform jacket, and went into the office. In contrast to the year before in Poltava, my colleagues sat there, downcast, indifferent, dulled. They shook hands silently. I too did not try to liven them up, being myself inwardly torn. The section leaders subsequently met together in Schmidt's office to wish Paulus a happy new year and to congratulate him on his promotion to Colonel General. I knew that he had been expecting this promotion. Now that it had arrived, he only gave a slight smile. We had already left the dugout when I realized that I had forgotten to add the third star to his appellates. I went back to see to this. To my apology, he said, leave it, Adam. Hitler only wants to relieve my end with this promotion. The normally withdrawn general started to recount his visits to the divisions. You can be pleased that you don't have to drive over the battlefield every day. When you return from a visit to the 76th Infantry Division one day, I clearly noticed how you had been struck by the experience. Meanwhile, everything has become much worse. Hunger is leaving ever crowder traces. At various dressing stations, the doctors assure me that the hunger and cold are causing many more deaths than enemy action. Hospitals and main dressing stations are completely full of thousands of wounded for whose attention the necessary things are lacking. In many, the will to live has gone. Hopelessness continues to spread. For all of this one only has fine words left. I thought, General, that following Hube's talk with Hitler, much would have changed. As far as I know Hugh, he would not have held anything back. Let us hope that he behaved that way. I only fear that it is now too late. I am bound in any case as before by Hitler's order to hold on here. Have you already heard, Colonel General, of the crazy rumors going all round the cauldron? On our western front, the soldiers of an SS division are rumored to have reached Kalach. Even the thunder of the guns has been heard. Others are already talking again of a parachute division having landed between Kalach and Karpova. I know about these rumors and I only want to know who is spreading such nonsense. One regimental commander said Potomac Airfield is the source of this nonsense. Perhaps he is right. I think it possible that the pilots of the transport aircraft either unknowingly or perhaps directed from outside are being set to conceal the fight to the death. Are you thinking of doing something against such rumor-mongering general? Should we not finally tell our soldiers the truth? Of course we have to. I am awaiting the return of Hugh to do so. In the first days of January, I received a call from the airfield commander. Two large transport aircraft have arrived with soldiers. Where shall we send them to? I was baffled. What use was a handful of soldiers to us against this deadly threat? Was this the reaction of Army Group Don to the Army Commander-in-Chief's message of the 26th December? We didn't need 40 or 100 soldiers, but fully established divisions. Above all, we needed food, ammunition, tanks, and fuel. Please wait 15 or 20 minutes. We will check which divisions need reinforcement most. I thought it over. The disbandment of the 79th Infantry Division had been ordered the previous day. The still available soldiers and officers had been divided up almost exclusively among the divisions fighting in the city and the divisional staff had been flown out. The 44th Infantry Division had suffered the most casualties in the last few days. Once Major General Schmidt had agreed, I told the divisional adjutant and told him to collect the newcomers. Paulus took this action by the Army Group as a hollow gesture. He told Army Group Don not to fly in any more soldiers and officers, just more supplies. Finally, he had made the bread ration for everyone even smaller. Manstein then forbade the further flying in of troops. As he was about to dismiss me, the Colonel General handed me a letter that he had received from Manstein. The Army Group Commander had expressed his sympathy and understanding in relation to the repeated requests from Paulus to permit the breakout of the 6th Army. However, the superior knew better how to judge the situation. Therefore, Paulus had to bear the consequences of the orders given. With this, the responsibility for whatever was to happen was lifted from him. That was interesting. Are you not aware, General, 
That man stem from whom we expected so much is completely bound by Hitler's dictatorship. I have that impression too, Adam. Actually, this recognition must have arisen earlier. Manstein, outside the cauldron occupied by the Sixth Army, must have known much sooner the enormous danger that threatened, and yet in recognizing it much more clearly nevertheless adhered to the lack of responsibility that went with Hitler's increasingly betrayed principle of order, obedience. His military, moral, and historical guilt for the shocking downfall of the Sixth Army would clearly be greater than that of Paulus and several other high-ranking officers of this army. But they too were led by the same soulless cliches and contributed to the Sixth Army's death sentence. Again and again, we took refuge in the hope that those whom we ourselves had already often had to convince would recognize that they were being unrealistic. So we kept asking ourselves, where is Hugh? We still did not know when something else would disturb the punishing waiting. On the 7th January 1943, the Red Army High Command informed the Commander-in-Chief of the 6th Army by radio of the appearance of three envoys. The Army declared itself ready to receive them. The next day, the Northern Front reported that envoys approached the fighting line. At the same time, Soviet loudspeakers announced the contents of the capitulation text. Pamphlets fell from red-starred aircraft and fluttered from the sky. At about the same time, it was announced that General Hugh had landed at Potomac. Tensely, we awaited his arrival at Army headquarters. Decorated with the oak leaves and swords to the Knight's Cross, Hugh drove directly to Paulus. In the presence of Schmidt, he reported on his meeting with Hitler. When I was shortly afterwards summoned to the Commander-in-Chief, Hugh was already on his way to his command post. I will tell you the news that General Hugh brought, so that you have an idea of the Army High Command's intentions. The Fuhrer is planning a new relief attack with much stronger forces than were available to Hulk. For this, tanks are to be concentrated behind a new southern front. Some of them will roll up next. Naturally, the assembling of these forces will take some time. The beginning of the attack can be reckoned as the middle of February. Hitler has agreed to renew the organization of air supply and to improve it considerably. So far, one can welcome the high command's plan. Now comes the great but. These measures can only be realized when it is possible to form a new southern front and to bring back Army Group A from the Caucasus without severe losses. Therefore, the 6th Army must continue to tie down as many of the enemy's forces as possible. For us, this means holding on. Hitler is merely agreeing to a reduction of the cauldron if it is absolutely necessary. May I now ask a question, General? How do these widespread breaches look from the outside? Where does the fighting front run in the southern sector? What forces will close the outstanding gaps resulting from the defeat of the Allied armies? I asked Hugh the same question. However, he was unable to give any satisfactory reply. At Fuhrer headquarters, as at Army Group Don, one is limited to some general hints. For certain, we only know that Army Group A is moving towards Rostov, at last one must say. For me, this is the bitterest thing that we have to suffer all these agonies any longer. The promise of improved supplies is more than vague. But as you say yourself, Adam, what can I do other than accept the order to fight on? Fighting on requires first of all that the army is saved from starvation, in addition to sufficient ammunition, fuel and medical requirements being flown in. Captain Topki flew off already eight days ago. I am convinced that he has tried everything to improve our supplies, but hardly anything seems to have changed. We simply lack the basics. Finally, the enemy is also on hand. The pilots report that the anti-aircraft defenses of the enemy have increased considerably within the last weeks. The shot down figures increase and the flying distances are longer. Many aircraft have to be repaired after being hit. Excuse me, General, if I say Hitler's renewed promises about the improvement of air supplies can be described not only as vague, but rather more as thoughtless. For me, the trust fades away with this eternal putting off. Paulus looked at me with astonishment. But you have gone along with it strongly in the last few days, Adam. Where is your usual optimism? Obviously, the army can only hold on until Hugh's relief date in the middle of February, providing the men are sufficiently and continuously supplied with all the necessary items. I do not conceal that I am skeptical in other respects. 
But firstly, I do not know all the Army High Command's air transport reserves. Secondly, I am not responsible for the fulfillment of the promises. And thirdly, my freedom to handle things was taken from me on the orders of the superior headquarters. On these grounds, I have also requested the decision of the Army High Command on the Red Army's offer of surrender. I presume that the answer will soon arrive. Lieutenant Colonel Zimmerman reported that the commanding generals were assembling in a room nearby. I went to my dugout. Later, the Army's chief engineer, Colonel Sell, told me that he had taken part in the conference that followed. All the commanding generals already knew the text of the offer of surrender. Paulus told them of Hube's report and asked them to state their positions. They all spoke against surrender. They'd assured him this was also the opinion of the divisional commanders. Meanwhile, the reply arrived from the Army High Command. It read, Capitulation out of the question. Every day that the Army holds out longer helps the whole front and draws away the Russian divisions from it. Paulus' request for freedom of action was again denied. Army Group Don shared the Army High Command's position. Major General Schmidt drew up the consequences from Hube's report and the surrender offered to the Army, which entailed a further calming of the staff, rear services, and hospitals with the aim of establishing more emergency units to strengthen the front line, and the further construction of positions for the West Front as already marked out by Sell, the Army's chief engineer. He went on to say, and future enemy envoys are to be driven back by fire. The chief of staff is back on top, said Sell. He has made me responsible for setting out the new line of defense. Where I will get the manpower, I have not been told, of course. Have you actually read the offer of surrender? No, I have not received a copy, only heard something about the content. Just concern yourself with it and read it through. There is much in it for you. The colonel had hardly gone when Kepper appeared with a leaflet in his hand. There I had the text of the Soviet ultimatum. It began with a detailed analysis of the Sixth Army situation. This fully coincided with my own assessment. It warned of the worst frost, the icy steppe winds and snowstorms to come. Apart from our hopeless situation and the futility of further resistance, the Red Army High Command suggested that, in order to avoid useless loss of blood, Resistance by all the surrounded German troops should cease and that they should organize themselves for surrender. It went on, all members of the Wehrmacht of these surrendering units will keep their uniforms, badges of rank and decorations, their personal necessities and valuables. The senior officers will retain their daggers and sidearms. The officers, non-commissioned officers and men who surrender will immediately receive normal rations. All wounded, Sick and frostbite cases will be given medical attention. We expect your reply in writing on the 9th January 1943 at 3 p.m. Moscow time through your personally appointed representative, who, in a recognizable car with a white flag, must drive along the road from the Connie Bypass to Kotlubin Station. Your representative will be awaited on the 9th January at 3 p.m. by authorized Russian officers in Department B, half kilometer southeast of the bypass. Should our request to surrender be rejected, we inform you that the troops of the Red Army and the Red Air Force will be forced to destroy the encircled German troops. The responsibility for their destruction will be borne by you. The letter was signed by representatives of the headquarters of the Red Army, Colonel General of Artillery Voronov, and the Commander-in-Chief of the Don Front, Lieutenant General Rokosovsky. I was of the opinion that, with the offer of capitulation, the survivors of the surrender need not fear a bullet in the back of the neck. On the other hand, I was unable to get away from Paulus's arguments. Looking back at this time, I must say today that the rejection of the offer to surrender was correct at the time, as the commander-in-chief of the 6th Army contested the decision of the Army High Command. On the other hand, it was pointless in light of the miserably dying divisions and the unscrupulous breach of faith by Hitler regarding the 6th Army that Paulus was denied the ability to exercise freedom of action in full agreement with the conventional military concept of loyalty to the loyal. I estimate that far more than 100,000 soldiers and officers would have been saved and able to return to their families at the end of the war. The argument that the blooded and hungry 6th Army would draw strong enemy forces away from the German Southern Front was based on scant evidence. The Soviet Supreme Command doubtless also knew that the 6th Army had been forbidden to break out by the High Command and that its fighting strength was greatly reduced. 
This knowledge enabled the Russians to seek an end to the Soviet troop concentration on the Volga. The rejection of the Soviet capitulation offer of the 8th January 1943 is historically, militarily and humanely seen as the greatest cause of blame not only on the part of the German High Command and the headquarters of Army Group Don, but also of the Commander-in-Chief of the 6th Army, its corps, and its divisions. The Soviet ultimatum was known to practically everybody. Colonel Elchlev confirmed it to me, as among the staff, it was made known to almost everyone in the army and the pros and cons discussed. Those awaiting the return of Hugh and the new plans for liberation were far more excited. The mood pendulum, which in the last 14 days had returned to doubt and apathy, swung back to the side of hope and courage. Are the poor lads aware of what can be awaiting them with the planned meeting with the relief force in the middle of February? Do you really believe, Elchlev, that we will get out of this? and that our troops can hold on for another six weeks. Yes, Adam, I really do believe it. You can be assured that Paulus will, as before, definitely carry out the Fuhrer's orders. Schmidt and I will reinforce him in this to the full. I don't understand one thing. Why does the Colonel General demand freedom of action then? In this present phase, one can only understand the suspension of the fighting because further resistance is futile. Breakthrough to the main front about 400 kilometers away is completely impossible from our heap of rubble. There is no difference of opinion between us over this. You say that capitulation does not come into the question. What will happen then? The fighting strength of our army is now sinking rapidly and will soon come to an end. Then we will go down as obedient soldiers. I repeat what I have said to you on other occasions. I will never go into Russian captivity. Do you believe that all soldiers and officers think as you do? I strongly doubt it. What little desire the men have to risk their lives in a more than questionable resistance is shown by a great aversion to the emergency units. Now we want to comb through again and set up more. Consequently, they are almost worthless. These men unaccustomed to fighting melt away like snow in the spring sunshine. You should think more about the calls for help from the troop commanders, Adam. The front sector of the 297 Infantry Division is only man skin deep. There are not the slightest reserves to seal off a breakthrough. Every man that we send them counts. We can't throw in the towel. It seems to me that Sel and Hooven have turned your head. Surrender is completely out of the question. That is all communist propaganda that they put in their leaflets. I don't believe a word of it. It only remains for us to fight to the last round. I could not penetrate such obstinacy. A rational conversation was impossible. On the afternoon of the 9th January, Paulus made an appeal to the troops. In it, the offer of surrender was written off as enemy propaganda aimed at undermining the soldiers' morale. No member of the army could believe the pamphlets. The order of the hour was much more to resolutely repel every enemy thrust until our renewed tank unit attacks had re-established connection with us. With hope once more revived that the cauldron would be pierced from outside, and the underlying fear of captivity, the will to hold on flared up again. Even the wounded grabbed their weapons once more. In contrast to this, there was an incident of reluctance by the troops, including the generals, to act. General Hugh had just resumed command of his panzer corps when the Army High Command ordered him to fly out immediately. He was to reorganize the supply of the 6th Army outside the cauldron. This was really a paradox. Of all people, the commanding general of the Panzer Corps was leaving the cauldron to take over a task better conducted by a professional. That was why the army headquarters had appointed the senior quartermaster, Colonel Botter, already weeks before. Was this a consequence of Hugh's visit to Fur headquarters? Why had he already flown out? Similar questions were asked of me repeatedly by generals and officers, making no secret of their anger. I too knew no more than they knew what was behind Hugh's order to fly out. General Hugh climbed into an aircraft flying out on the night of the 10th January. At my suggestion, Lieutenant General Schlummer, commander of the 3rd Motorized Infantry Division, took over the command of the 14th Panzer Corps. There were several individual well-known cases in which officers tried to sneak out of the cauldron. One such was the first general staff officer of the 14th Panzer Division, Lieutenant Colonel Petzl, he asked me to obtain him permission to fly out from Schmidt. What should I do here now? He said, The division hardly exists anymore. 
Its remains have been incorporated into battle groups. The divisional commander, Colonel Lapman, is forming new emergency units on the orders of the commander-in-chief, so I am completely superfluous. I suggested to Petzold that he take his request personally to Major General Schmidt, as he came directly under him as a general staff officer. He did that, as was to be expected, the chief of staff promptly kicked him out. But the lieutenant colonel had not given up. He tried again under a different guise. Promptly the next day he put in his application for a transfer to the SS. But he had no luck with Schmidt. His crumpled application ended up in the waste paper basket. More cunning was the quartermaster of the 8th Corps. Knowing that he would never be permitted to fly out, he went directly to Potomac. He said that he had to clarify some supply problems and was thus able to climb into an aircraft ready to take off. When Paulus heard of the quartermaster's clever trick, he applied to Army Group Don for a court-martial for desertion. As I later learned, this quartermaster was shot. But such cases of personal deceit among the officers were exceptional. The majority of officers took the order to fight to the last round seriously, sharing the hunger, pain, misery, and death with their soldiers. But what they took as moral duty, loyalty, and obedience was, through the criminal concept of war and the irresponsible conduct of the long-involved highest state and Wehrmacht leadership, nothing but shameless deceit. Their superhuman devotion arose out of a false trust. They were prisoners of military ideology. In this lay the tragedy of many of those German soldiers and officers who fought and died at Stalingrad. And the senior military leaders of the 6th Army contributed to this tragedy. The air thundered. The ground shook. Steel rained down on Fortress Stalingrad, savaging people and animals, destroying dugouts and vehicles, tearing apart weapons and telephone lines. The links between Army headquarters and the staff were reduced to a few radio sets that had escaped the shells, mines and rockets. The Red Army was replying to our rejection of the offer of surrender. We are riding on the 10th January 1943. In the IS dugout the wireless operator was trying to reach the 8th Corps. At the beginning of the bombardment a message had got through that reported devastating results from the bombardment. Then the Corps fell silent. The connection was broken. While we waited feverishly until the repair teams had reconnected the line, the artillery fire eased off. Presumably the enemy's tanks and infantry were going into the attack. Then the 8th Corps came through again. Soviet tanks had broken through our western front and part of our southern front, simply crushing their way through. Our troops were fighting doggedly, but in vain. They were unable to withstand this attack, especially as few anti-tank weapons were available. Even the rifle ammunition was almost gone. There were also no collection points for them. Despite the orders of the Chief of Staff, Schmidt, it was not possible to dig trenches and bunkers in the concrete hard frozen ground. Those who did not fall or fled were captured in the second or third waves of attacking Soviet units. The armored attacking wedge was biting ever deeper into our front. We had no reserves that we could throw in against it. Gradually, we gained a clearer picture of the new situation. The main attack had been against the divisions of the 8th Corps and the 14th Panzer Corps. Its goal was the heart of the cauldron at Potomac Airfield. The 44th, 76th, and 29th motorized infantry divisions were badly hit. For the moment, it was not possible to get an idea of which of these divisions still existed and could be employed in a renewed defense. Bad news arrived continually by radio and telephone. The first orderly officer had his hands full maintaining the situation map. There also seemed to be a disaster in the southwestern corner of the cauldron. The third motorized infantry division had been there since the end of November 1942. Now the districts of Mitrieka in the west and Rocatino and Zabenko in the south had been lost. The first general staff officer looked at these places. I looked questioningly at him. Are you thinking that the 3rd Motorized Infantry Division is threatened with encirclement, Elchlep? Certainly, until now the division has been able to repulse all enemy attacks. Now, however, since the loss of the Dmitrievka and Rokotino districts, it has become threatened on both flanks. We must immediately retake these southwest pointing projections. He reached for the telephone receiver and had himself connected to the Chief of Staff, newly promoted to Lieutenant General. Schmidt was already in the picture, as was Colonel General Paulus, 
who was with him. The division received orders to get itself out of the encirclement and take up a new defensive position along the line Mitri Karokatino. Messengers and orderly officers came and went one after another at the headquarters on this disastrous day. It was hard to distinguish between any of these numbered figures of soldiers. Only eyes, mouth and nose could be seen of these material shrouded figures, their legs and feet being mainly wound round with cut up blankets. What remained was dressed and faded, worn out gray coats. Only a fortunate few possessed winter clothing, and that was mainly of Russian origin. With their frosted hands they were often unable to unfasten the clasps of their map cases and pull out the messages. Once they had slurped down two glasses of tea, they recounted in spurts their frightful experiences in the past hours, the shot up artillery positions and exploded ammunition dumps, the panic among the supply troops and the wounded. While their legs still carried them, they were fleeing into the city on the Volga in naked fear, throwing everything away like children. A second lieutenant from a division on the southwestern front recounted how in the last two days two or three German communists had called across asking them to give up fighting and go over to the Russians. We have heard such propaganda often already. I cannot go along with them. What is new, nevertheless, is that now a German captain and two lieutenants have gone over to the communists. Do all the soldiers react like you? I asked him. They listen to the words, but they don't believe them either. In fact, fear of capture was so great that even in the most hopeless situations, where every minute of continuing to hold on could bring death, only a few soldiers went over to the Red Army. The year-long business of anti-Soviet agitation was fully absorbed in the thoughts and behavior of most Germans. This disabled the brain and alone drove tens of thousands to their death in the Stalingrad cauldron, when they could have been spared if only they had listened to the voices from the other side. Colonel General Paulus reported the results of difficult breaches on the cauldron's western and southern fronts. He added that 6th Army Headquarters saw no real opportunity of preventing the enemy advance. Nevertheless, thrown together emergency units had occupied the threatened positions. Although Paulus and Schmidt were clear that a further weakening of the divisions fighting within the city was no longer their responsibility, they ordered the List Corps to give up the most available battalions, companies, and artillery units to the western and southern fronts. The military machinery groaned but kept going. It obeyed its own laws. Colonel General Paulus was himself in deadly danger suffering from the burden of his responsibility. But he, like those around him, believed that the blame for the catastrophe must lie not only with Hitler, but also with the Army High Command and Army Group Don. Meanwhile, we went on functioning with bleeding hearts and tormented souls. And this continuation cost many their lives. I will never forget the talk that I had with Paulus on the evening of the 10th January 1943. It demonstrated our personal conflict but also the fact that we then agreed on all final measures for the continuation of the war. We believed that the 6th Army had to be sacrificed for this. My dear Adam, many soldiers and officers are now asking why did Paulus not accept that ultimatum? Why, in this hopeless situation, did he not handle it against Hitler's orders? They know that I have no right to go against the orders of the High Command, but it was not only that which prevented me from complying with the capitulation. What would become of the war if our army in the Caucasus was also surrounded? That danger is real, but as long as we keep on fighting, the Red Army has to remain here. They need these forces for a big offensive against Army Group A in the Caucasus and along the still unstable front from Voronezh to the Black Sea. We must hold them here to the last so that the Eastern Front can be stabilized. Only if that happens is there a chance of the war going well for Germany. If I may be allowed to make a remark, Colonel General, I too in your place would equally decline to decide upon capitulation. But let us suppose for once, would the Russian armies released from here really not take weeks to get to the front 300 kilometers away? There you are certainly making an error. The Russians are great at improvisation, as the past has repeatedly shown. What seems impossible to us, they make possible. With our dubious situation in the southern sector, any strengthening of the enemy forces can be disastrous for us. I will perhaps be responsible should this war be lost. We must fight on to prevent such a catastrophe. Neither Colonel General Paulus 
Nora then thought that the actual misfortune in starting the war was that it had politically, economically, and militarily been an anachronism from the beginning, because it went contrary to the passage of time. The First World War had already shown that the policy of conquest and robbery that had been practiced by some imperialist states in the 19th century could not be repeated in the 20th century. The war represented a challenge to other states who united against the German desire for conquest and punished the instigator. Even more anachronistic was the unequivocal starting of the Second World War by Hitler's Germany. It had to be shattered by the will to resist of the people, especially the socialist might of the Soviet Union. The key questions regarding the character of the war, its historical role and its political moralistic aim were not challenged by us. We were too far away from this to even recognize it. Brought up in a nationalistic and military spirit, we could hardly challenge it. That was the real key to our misfortune, the door to the abyss into which we were thrown ever deeper through our accepted duty to hold on. As on the 10th January, so followed on subsequent days one frightful piece of news after another, they were all the same, renewed breaches in the makeshift enclosed defensive ring, flight from attacking tanks, abandoning of positions without orders to do so, the failure of commanders of emergency units, signs of disintegration everywhere. Especially alarming news came on the 12th January. Potomac, our only airfield, had been abandoned in flight from Russian tanks. The chief of staff was enraged. How could such a thing happen? After the last report, we had the impression that no immediate danger threatened there. Was this just a rumor? Schmidt wanted to know for certain, as it would have an immediate effect upon Army headquarters. The reconnaissance team returned after a short time. It appeared that our troops, airmen, drivers, medical staff, and wounded had taken to their heels from an enemy reconnaissance troop, which had subsequently withdrawn. This time I could understand Schmidt's scornful outburst. Paulus ordered the airfield to be more strongly protected and put back in action as soon as possible. Afterwards, a staff officer who had driven to Potomac to pick up the post reported, within a few minutes it was absolute chaos. He recounted, on the cry, the Russians are coming. Healthy, sick, and wounded rushed out of tents and bunkers, everyone trying to reach the exits as quickly as possible. Some fell and were trampled down. Those unable to walk properly clung onto colleagues, stumbling on with sticks or rifles and hobbling in the icy cold towards Stalingrad. Many wounded and exhausted men collapsed on the way. No one looked after them. Several hours later, they were frozen. Bitter fighting broke out over places on vehicles. Luftwaffe ground staff, medical order lice and lightly wounded ran off to the few trucks standing on the edge of Potomac airfield, started up the engines and tried to get to the road leading to the city. In a short, while men were hanging onto the wings, running boards and even the radiators, the vehicles threatened to break apart under the loads. Many remained immobile from lack of fuel or engine damage. Those following made detours round them. Those men capable of walking hurried more or less quickly away, the others calling for help. But not for long, their calls soon ceased from the freezing that overcame them. There was only one motto, save yourselves those who can. What safety could the destroyed city give that was now also being attacked by the enemy from the Volga? It was not only a matter of physical safety, but more especially was an escape from the fear-driven delusions of whipped, ragged, half-dead men whose bodies and spirits had been torn apart by the destructive battle. Although it very quickly became known that the airfield was back in our hands, it had been torn apart by a Soviet reconnaissance party, and only a few of the sick and wounded turned back. The shock was too deeply seated in their bones. On the other hand, most of the pilots and medical orderlies were back in Potomac by evening. Fresh plans were being made at Army headquarters and especially at the List Corps headquarters. Could we not make the cauldron smaller and thus better concentrate our forces and form a proper reserve? Impossible, said Paulus. That would mean the voluntary abandonment of the life essential airfield. Should one give up the battle? No, no way. That would be tantamount to imprisonment and would endanger our surrounded comrades outside the cauldron. Perhaps we could break out on all sides in small groups without artillery preparation. This suggestion came from Saitlitz's staff. He foresaw the divisions lying on the Volga bank seeking to cross the frozen river to the south 
and breaking through behind the enemy lines. There they would have to combine with the divisions fighting between the Don and the Volga and simultaneously pressing south. All these aims must, according to this plan, make connections with the German troops outside the cauldron. We took into account that the retreating Hoth army was still fighting south of Zimlianskaya. Schmidt thought that such a breakout undertaking would be very costly for the 6th Army. Nevertheless, he agreed to it. Strange, I thought. Until now, he had stubbornly demanded that Hitler's orders be carried out implicitly. Now that it was too late, he was going to be disobedient. But this plan too remained a fantasy. It was just about imaginable for those divisions whose soldiers had been lying in the streets for weeks and whose bodies were somewhat less fit. All others regarded it as completely illusory, as their half-starving, sick soldiers could no longer carry out an attack. Such considerations showed how much the army leadership was groping in the dark, as in the higher commands too panic ruled. No one knew how the German troops in the southern sector were faring. That would have meant they had returned to their starting point in the summer of 1942, so the whole of the fighting in the previous year had been for nothing. That could not be. Manstein, who knew exactly, still gave Paulus no clear information. Although the 6th Army was left in the lurch at a critical time, Paulus and Schmidt once more made an attempt to persuade Manstein to make a decision in favor of those surrounded in this dubious situation. They ordered the commander of the 9th Flak Division, Major General Pickard, to fly to Army Group Don and to report to Field Marshal von Manstein exclusively over the catastrophic conditions in the cauldron. During the last few days, even fewer supply aircraft than usual had landed. Hunger was advancing forwards much more rapidly than before. Pickard was finally to get a better air supply service working, not least to alleviate the 6th Army's severe losses. Basically, this step by Army headquarters was exactly as delusive as the several previous attempts. It also had another unexpected consequence. General Pickard did not return to the cauldron. Before taking off, he had assured both his Chief of Staff and Colonel General Paulus in his farewell visit that he would fly back as soon as he had completed his task. But we waited in vain. Instead, a radio message arrived. Flew over Potomac last night. Attempt to land failed. Had to turn back. That same night, other aircraft had landed at Potomac. We were furious. Nevertheless, nothing was done about Hair Picker. I sat in my dugout and leafed through the papers that Senior Surgeon Major Kepper had left. There were enemy pamphlets among them, so I pushed them aside. My thoughts wandered between home and front. If the family at home knew what was being played out on the step between the Volga and the Don, if they could only see these hollow traces of hunger, these faces blackened by dirt and frost, but the army's reports still rang full of hope. Not a word about the frightful cruelty of this destructive battle. I had not read a newspaper for weeks, and there had been no news from my wife and daughter for weeks. They would be worried about it. What would become of them when they received the dreadful news about our end? Mechanically, I reached for the pamphlets. Almost thoughtlessly, I passed them one after another from hand to hand. Then I began to read. Various parts were underlined. The names of the writers, Walter Olbrecht, Eric Weiner, and Willie Bredel, meant little to me. I only knew that they were communist immigrants, that was no recommendation for me then. But what they wrote was not meaningless. Their language was clear and impressive. Their knowledge of our situation amazing. They knew of our fear of captivity and of our trust in Hitler's promises to care for our liberation. In all the pamphlets, it was written that Hitler and the army high command had lied and betrayed us when they promised to rescue us from this deadly encirclement as they had no chance of doing so. The writers speculated that the Army High Command had no clear picture of the overall war situation. One pamphlet contained exact details of losses in war material in the last fighting. Others spoke of Hitler's betrayal of the German people, of the senseless dying, of the purposelessness of further battles. At one point it said significantly, We are sitting here together with German prisoners of war. Stop the fighting immediately. This is the only way of saving your lives. I leafed through the pamphlets again and again. Contemplation on an empty stomach, I must say, in many instances often led to the same consequence. The last promises of Hitler, the Army High Command in Manstein, had they not been empty words, none or almost none of them had amounted to anything. 
what had been set out in high-sounding phrases had simply not been realized. But could we believe these Germans speaking to us from the enemy side? Were they not communists who had betrayed our country? Certainly, seen from a military point of view, they were right, as my experience told me, as my understanding told me too. But as a soldier, as an officer, I rejected this propaganda, as it damaged the fighting morale of the troops. Then another pamphlet drew my attention. Paulus had said that the purpose of continuing to hold on gave Army Group A in the Caucasus the opportunity of escaping from its own looming encirclement. However, here it said that Army Group A was already operating in the Rostov area. Had Paulus been deceived, was Manstein deliberately not giving him a clear picture? I saw no way out of the labyrinth into which this reading of the pamphlets had led me. Finally, I read the names of three officers who had been captured back in 1941. Captain Dar Haderman, Lieutenant Caresius, and Lieutenant Rager. I was brought up short, Dar Haderman, so an officer of the reserve. As I recalled, he came from the Hess town of Schlutcher. There I had got to know a scholar at a gymnasium called Haderman. He was studying late philology, but what this name already meant. The three officers would talk to our troops through loudspeakers at night. That confirmed what the second lieutenant had told me on the 10th January after coming to see me, frozen through from the southern front. Damn it, what could one really believe? Had Kepper made a fool of me with this thing. I summoned him. Why did you put this pamphlet on my desk? I asked him as he came in. I thought that it might interest you, Colonel, he said. Have you also read what is in it, Kepper? What do you make of it? You can peacefully give your opinion, I said as he started to reply. Certainly, Colonel, we have read the pamphlet. The order to hand in immediately all leaflets found, according to the messenger, was only followed superficially. Although hardly anyone would have the courage to run over to the Red Army, the opinion gradually gathered that the Russians did not shoot prisoners of war. A messenger from the 4th Corps told me yesterday that during the night the soldier of the 371st Infantry Division, who was well known, spoke from the Russian trenches through a loudspeaker. Has this pamphlet been discussed among the soldiers of the staff, Kepper? Already much has been discussed about this lately. Some reject it, others again think about it and even defend it here and there. In any case, hardly any believe any more about being shot in the back of the neck in captivity. Kepper left my office. I had almost no more work, but plenty of time to think things over. Equally thoughtful, though perhaps angry was more accurate, was Paulus, who called for me after a while. Lieutenant Zimmerman had given me the wink. The Colonel General really needed to speak to me. I knocked and entered. He was sitting at his desk, his arms propped up and scratching his head with his right hand. I knew this movement well already. It came mainly with an especially strong sucking in of his cheeks. What has been happening here? I thought. In front of him lay a sheet of paper. Without saying a word, he handed it to me. I looked at it. It was another pamphlet, but one directed at Paulus and signed by Walter Ulbricht, a member of the German Reichstag. I read it carefully, sentence by sentence. In clear, logical reasoning, Ulbricht said that Paulus, by following the orders of Hitler and the Army High Command, was not acting in the interests of Germany and the German people. His duty was to give up the senseless fight. I looked at the Army commander questioningly and gave him the pamphlet back. Slowly Paulus began to speak. Of course, the publisher of this is right from his point of view. He sees the whole business as a politician. For my military obedience, for the considerations that led to my decision, he can have no understanding as a civilian. Before you called me, Colonel General, I had a number of pamphlets from Ulbricht, Weiner, and Bredel in my hands. Their language is not what we are accustomed to. Everything in me resists them, but on many points they tell the truth. We could say so, Adam, but they see everything through different eyes from us. I do not deny these men goodwill in any way, but for me this is undermining the men's discipline and that I cannot allow. Where will we get to if soldiers in wartime work against the government of their own land? I am myself not certain what is correct and true, Colonel General. But I have asked myself again and again what sense there is in the dying of tens of thousands. Is the traditional conception of military obedience enough in a situation in which our trust in the high command has more than once been shabbily betrayed? What compelling military grounds are there today to justify our extinction? 
May I take it, General, that you know the content of all these leaflets? In one, it is said that Army Group Caucasus is already fighting in the Rostov area, in which case the danger of its encirclement must be over. Why then the frightful human sacrifice of the Sixth Army? I have read it, but cannot believe it. We cannot be critical enough with everything to do with propaganda. But what if it should be the truth, if we are knowingly or unknowingly being led astray by higher headquarters? I don't agree with everything you say. Manston knows from Pickard what a desperate situation we are in. I simply cannot imagine that the suffering and dying of our army does not disturb him, that the victims being demanded from us are unnecessary. I stand here as ordered and cannot be responsible for Army Group A in the Caucasus. It was reflected over and discussed, but the way out of the devil's circle we closed ourselves. We were not capable of extracting ourselves from the formal responsibility against senseless, even criminal orders in the real responsibility to our people. Nothing then could alter the rousing words of German anti-fascists. Lieutenant General Schmidt had me call him. Adam, you are to reconnoiter the new headquarters. We are intending that the 71st Infantry Division takes over in the city south of the Zaritsa stream. As far as I know, the dugouts in a gully near Stalingradsky should suit us. Take the advanced detachment with you. At the point where the way from the Stalingrad road turns off to the gully, an orderly officer from the 71st Infantry Division will be waiting for you. Upon returning to my bunker, I contacted the divisional adjutant and agreed a time for the meeting with the detail officer. At 9 a.m. on the 13th January, my vehicle stood ready to move. It was only a few hundred meters to the roadway. Lines of distressed refugees were still heading towards the city. After just a kilometer, my cross-country jeep was full of wounded. Two were even standing on the running boards. Drive slowly, I said to the driver, who was worried about the axles and springs. I decided to make a little detour to Stalingrad and deliver the wounded to a hospital there. Although the car was already heavily overloaded, we took another one shortly afterwards. From quite a distance, I saw him standing, one thickly wrapped hand stretched out in supplication. As we came slowly towards him, I discerned a desperate face. Tears were rolling down his cheeks. He hobbled towards us. Please take me to Stalingrad. My driver and I crashed together to make room for him. The youngster was not yet 19 years old. He had severe frostbite on both hands and feet. He had been hobbling along the street for hours. No one had taken pity on him. He did not know how he should thank me. He kept on trying to shake my hand. Stalingrad seemed to be his salvation. I put them all down at the hospital in the western part of the city after having a few words about them with the duty doctor. We almost had to carry the youngsters. In farewell, he wanted to give me a small hard sausage. It is from Muddy. I have been saving it, he said sincerely. Naturally, I gave it back. You need it more than I do, young friend. Innumerable dead lay alongside the roadway. Many were the corpses of wounded and sick who had only wanted to lie down for a short rest to try to regain some strength. They had fallen asleep from fatigue and frozen to death. The dead also lay on the street. Nobody made any effort to remove them. Tanks and trucks with unfeeling, stupid drivers rolled over the hard frozen corpses and flattened them and pedestrians tripped and stumbled over them. The road deserved the description Death Street. This name applied also to the hundreds of wrecks of all kinds of trucks, cars, and special vehicles destroyed by bombs, turned over, the truck beds ripped, the occupants torn apart. In between the smashed tanks and guns, here and there lay a burnt-out aircraft and countless fully intact vehicles lacking only one thing, fuel. My vehicle stopped, the orderly officer from the 71st Infantry Division climbed in. From the first impression, there was no need to talk to me. We were already at our destination. We turned into a deep ravine, at the bottom of which a road ran between the steeply rising walls on either side and a proper bunker settlement had been built. It was called Hartmannstadt, after the divisional commander, Lieutenant General Von Hartmann, the bunkers had been constructed in three stories, connected by steps in the left-hand wall. Steps and pavements were protected by railings. Even a kitchen and a food store had been included in the steep slope. The 71st Infantry Division had captured the northern forts of Verdun, Vaux, and Duomont in the Western Campaign. It was known as the Happy One, 
and its vehicles carried a four-leaf clover emblem as a distinguishing mark. But now luck had left it without a trace. I found Lieutenant General Vaughn Hartman in a very depressed mood. What a frightful situation we have been brought to. There is no longer any escape. Of my division, of which I was always so proud, nothing much remains, it will not last to the end. I too saw only black on black and told him of my terrible journey on Death Street. You are right. These frightful pictures are enough to break one's heart and rob one of one's sanity. In our further discussion, I discovered that he too had lost his only son in the war. Fallen for the fatherland, as we had believed for so long, or at least imagined. After the bitter experiences of the last months, this explanation seemed very questionable. But even more frightful was having to say that they had died senselessly. As I was leaving, I had the feeling that Hartman was more torn and lost than I was. The adjutant and orderly officers showed me around the well-constructed dugouts. There was a sturdily built stove in every one. Beds, tables and chairs were available in sufficient numbers. Curtains and blackout materials hung at every window. All the rooms were illuminated by electric light. How primitive our headquarters had been until now. The divisional staff intended to leave the next day. An advance party from our headquarters had to take over in the next few hours. Using a sketch map, I divided up the individual dugouts among our staff. Then I set off back. Once I had informed Schmidt about the events of my journey, I asked him when the move was to take place. That depends on how the situation develops further and when the telephone connections are ready to be taken over. As long as Potomac is in our hands, we stay here, he said. Finally, I reported to Colonel General Paulus about Hartmannstadt and about the ghastly things I had experienced on the way. It is really frightful, he said. If I knew that Army Group A was safe, I would put an end to it. As no one has authorized me to do so, I must fight on as long as it is possible somehow. Can our troops still fight, Colonel General? The front in the West will collapse on the first assault. It will close up again. Potomac is still in our hands. And who goes into captivity willingly? The soldiers are still hoping for relief and do not want to think about surrendering. This reinforces me in my dealings. In fact, a mix of anxiety and hope certainly filled the thoughts of most soldiers. Among the army staff, no one thought seriously of a relief. However, no one had the courage to tell the troops the truth. It was also clear that we could not hold on to Potomac for much longer. Schmidt therefore ordered that the war diaries of our staff should be flown out so that they did not fall into the hands of the enemy. The first orderly officer of the command section, Captain Bear, a dashing young holder of the Knight's Cross, was tasked with this. He should next describe the fight to the death of the Sixth Army and then fly on to the Army High Command to report personally to Hitler how distressfully the Sixth Army was perishing and starving. The army commanders thought that a highly decorated captain would have more influence than a general. Bear did not return to the cauldron. Today, I do not know whether he was hindered in this so that the hopeless situation of the Sixth Army would remain veiled. From my personal knowledge of the captain, I do not know whether he held things back either with Manstein or with Hitler. But the number of supply aircraft did not increase. The army languished even further. The field kitchens remained cold as there was nothing to cook in them. Even the little evening meal diminished here and there. The front had pressed closer to Potomac. Red Army fighters flew over the airfield and shot up many of our unprotected Ju 52s, and he 111s flying in. Others that had been able to land were destroyed on the ground by Soviet bombers or low flying sewing machines. It was no use if Schmidt radioed the detached Captain Tolk. Hit them with a cudgel if no more aircraft are employed. On the 14th January, an advance party from the Army headquarters took over the headquarters of the 71st Infantry Division. That day, Potomac was finally lost. The ground crews were still able to move over to the replacement airfield at Gumrack, which had been prepared in a rough and ready manner in the previous two days. Colonel General Heats, the commanding general of the 8th Corps, had to clear his headquarters on the edge of Potomac in a hurry. He appeared with his staff in the former headquarters near Gumrack. Similarly, the headquarters of the 14th Panzer Corps, until then between Potomac and Novo Alexievsky, had to move to near Gumrack. On this day, Colonels Latman and Darkorfs were promoted major generals. 
Major General Lapman, whose Panzer Division had been completely eradicated, was given the command of the 389th Infantry Division in place of his former commander, Major General Magnus, who had proved completely useless in this situation. Perhaps Magnus hoped that Schmidt would let him be flown out, but that was not so. By the middle of January, the cauldron was considerably reduced in size. The new front in the south and west ran along the Ring Road. It was occupied by the tattered remains of the 44th, 76th, 297th, and 376th Infantry Divisions, the 3rd and 29th Motorized Infantry Division, the 14th Panzer Division, and the so-called Fortress Battalions. Now Army Headquarters near Gumrak was under immediate threat. We feared that the new defensive ring would not hold out much longer. The bunkers occupied by our headquarters were required by the fighting troops. Therefore, the staff moved on the morning of the 16th January to Hartmannstadt. Again, files and pieces of equipment were burnt. Only the absolutely essentials went to the new site. We drove along the roadway and the few remaining vehicles in small convoys passed the ghostly starving, sick, and wounded soldiers to the new headquarters site. At Gumrak Station, we encountered a dense crowd of wounded, who, driven by fear, were leaving the hospital and trying to make their way east. The badly wounded and the very ill remained behind, there being no transport available for them. For most of them, the spark of life was about to expire anyway. Paulus had ordered the senior doctors to hand over the hospitals to the advancing enemy. The Russians found heaps of hard-frozen German soldiers' corpses, that had been carried out on stretchers or planks from the house of the dying. Themselves weak, the medical order lies no longer wanted to hack out graves for the dead in the hard frozen ground, and there were no more explosives available. 